what we have today is a CFM talk about getting started with your cloud financial management journey. And it will have AWS tooling demos included. We, today we have two awesome speakers, Steph Gooch and Connor Murphy. Steph Gooch is a senior commercial architect um, and Connor Murphy is a customer enablement specialist. And both of them have multiple years of working in this space at AWS and um, with a lot of different customers, a lot of different experiences to go from. And as we look at this talk, if we go to the next one, we sent all of these around questions. So when we go and work with everyone to, to build these presentations, we always go back to what are the questions we know customers have and that we can answer for them through this talk. So today's focused around where do I begin as I start to look to optimize my AWS costs? What can I do to get that spend visibility in my AWS spend? Just like you saw in the poll, being able to see those costs is, is a high priority when you're just getting started. But where can I start if I'm looking to plan for future cloud spend? You saw that wasn't that far behind. So the biggest thing that we see is how do we see that? How do we see it? How do we know where to save? How do we plan? And then once you start getting past that, you start getting into how can I maintain control over that cost and that insecurity? So how do I keep that, that momentum going? So that's what we're here to talk about today. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over. All right, I think the next slide is still mine. So we talk a little bit more about those pillars we just were talking about, that C, save, plan, and run. So in, in C, we see that account tagging strategy, cost reporting, show back. Uh, under save, we see that cost aware architecture and design, identifying waste, choosing the right pricing models. And then under plan, you've got that budgeting as well as cost estimation that goes that is built into those cost aware architectures. And then that run side, it's not just the technology of how do you manage to run, but also the people side, securing that sponsorship, investing in the governance and the people and the tools and celebrating accomplishments. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Steph. To get us started. Hi guys. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Connor, do you want to go back to the other one quickly? I just want to cover yep. a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Sweet. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully, you're going to take away some valuable information about tooling and concepts around the four pillars from CFM from the AWS point of view that you can implement into your business. And like we said, we'll be sharing out this deck. We've also got Savannah in the background who'll be answering many questions as well as Gina. So feel free to put questions as you go and I think we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. So just to go over these pillars, so we wanna focus on these four pillars that AWS has um, and these are really important to having a successful CFM practice at your business. And so just to go over them in a little more detail. So we've got C, a lot, um, a lot of you mentioned that, which is a very good starting point. That's where we put a lot of our customers to start our conversations around CFM, because if you can't see your data, how do you know if you're doing well? How do you know where you can optimize? So creating that transparency, transparency, and we do that a lot through things like account strategy, tagging and tooling for cost visualization. And Connor will go through a bit later, a really useful tool, Cost Explorer, um, that you can use to see. Uh, we've also got save. So we've actually mixed these orders up a little bit, but um, today we normally do them in a different order, but we'll be changing the order today and through the presentation. But often we have save next. So once you can see your data, how do you save? Um, and we also have save and cost optimization, which I think of as two different things. So when it comes to saving, that's all about how to get the best kind of price for the resource you're using. So you're thinking about commitments and discounts that you can have. But then optimization is more around how are you using the cloud for the most optimal cost? So how are you scheduling resources? How are you only using what you need when it comes to the cloud? And we'll go through a couple more of those in a minute. Plan, getting more finance involved, thinking about forecasting, thinking about spend, making sure that there is no cost shock, making sure that you're setting up your, for success by creating resources in a way that are going to be running sustainably. You're going to have data awareness and tooling set up to protect you and know how much money you're spending going forward and then run. So I definitely think, like he said, a lot of this is people as well as technology. So making sure you're building with a cost aware mindset and make sure you have established tools and governance around so you can keep going with that. OK, so a little bit of background about me and Connor. Let me move on. Um, so, um, as I said, my name is Stephanie Gooch. I'm a senior commercial architect in a team called Optics. And my main goal is to help customers 
optimize their spend in any way possible, as well as creating external resources such as blogs. We have a Twitch show and well-architected labs. Connor? Yep, no, thanks, Steph, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. My name is Connor Murphy. I'm on the same optics team as Steph is. However, I have a slightly different role. I'm a customer enablement specialist here at AWS, and really what I focus on is a little bit more of purchase strategy, overall cost and usage visibility, and really just helping uh, our customers who are starting off in uh, their CFM journeys. Really kind of a first point of contact to help with any education and overall enablement with these tools. Awesome. All right, so let's kick off with our first pillar. So first of all, we're gonna be talking about save, and we've got AWS Graviton there, and I'll go into why in a second. So we wanted to, as this is a starting CFM talk, we wanted to highlight a couple of different ways that you can start optimizing today and kind of show you this scale, which I really started to, to use a lot more recently, which is kind of technical complexity versus cost saving impact. So this is kind of how hard is it to do versus how much money is you going to save in a realistic point of view. So for example, commitments is up at the top there with a massive saving impact, especially RIs and savings plans, but there's very little technical complexity. You can just go into that console and purchase those savings plans and instantly get a saving. But we do recommend making sure that you check with whoever's in charge before you start jumping in and buying stuff and also check about how you're using your resources. So you can often start small with this kind of process and maybe buy a little bit of savings plans. When I first started, I actually only bought a dollar of savings plans. And then my my old company had about 500 accounts. So it was a very small commitment, but it allowed me to see what impact it would have on my business and what savings would actually look like. So maybe you start small. And then when it comes to things like elasticity and efficiency, you can start to review your current infrastructure and see am I using it correctly? So could I make any savings by turning instances off or using auto scaling groups or actually deleting idle resources that I no longer need? So kind of making sure that you are actually using the cloud efficiently before you then start to scale any more commitments. Moving over to the right a little bit more when it becomes a little bit more technical, especially with things like efficiency, we're talking about right sizing. So making sure that the instance sizes you actually are using are suitable for the workloads. So a lot of times people will spin stuff up. I'm definitely one of the people that used to do this. I would spin up infrastructure and I would choose an arbitrary instance type and then never look at it again. And until I became more aware of how important those choices are and how much it affects the bill, I wasn't making any changes and I wasn't reviewing any data such as CloudWatch or Compute Optimizer to kind of influence my decision. Coming up, we also have modernization, which we'll be talking about in a bit, but cost aware architecture. So using spot, using serverless, building for the cloud. And this takes probably the longest time and is often the kind of goal a lot of us are looking for when it comes to optimization, because we're actually using what I said the cloud is designed for. But today we're going to be talking a bit about modernization, especially around Graviton. So we wanted to give you this talk so that you could understand the four pillars of CFM and tools and demos in which to understand it, but with kind of a storyline. So we're going to be using Graviton as a storyline for this session. So as we go into more of save, we're going to talk a little bit about what Graviton is, and then we'll go through see and plan and run using Graviton as a story point. So if we move on, let's talk about Graviton. So in case you're not aware, AWS Graviton are processes designed by AWS. Uh, they deliver the best price performance for your cloud workloads. And it's based on ARM processes and can offer a 40% price performance on the service. That means for EC2, for example, 20% cost saving and 20% more efficient usage of compute. Therefore, you can often downsize your instances and using the using kind of they cost less money, um, but you are getting the same performance out of it. So it is awesome. If you haven't checked it out, I recommend kind of deep dive for seeing what is available. But to get you started we have this massive list of um, different options on which you can get started. So this is quite cool. This We created this recently. Like that kind of scale we had of technical efficiency versus cost, we also have this kind of difficulty scale when it comes to Graviton because not everything works on Graviton out the box. Luckily, a bunch of services do. So we have workloads such as RDS, Aurora, managed services that are straight away compatible. But then as you go down the list, it gets a little bit more technical, a little bit harder, especially when you get down to things like EC2 or compute, because this is where you might have to recompile your code. But really recommend taking a look at this and then maybe 
using the skills that Connor's going to teach you to look at your cost explorer to see where you could maybe identify some workloads that could use Graviton and you could get that saving. But again, to get you started, we have a bunch of managed services that really do work well with Graviton. Um, so if we go into the next slide, we have this list here. So these are great places to start. So like I dipped my toe in the water for savings plans, you could do the same thing when it comes to Graviton with these services. So managed services are the best place to start, I would say, just because we manage the service. So you don't have to do very much work when it comes to making that change. All you need to do is a very small change. You, as long as your engine version is the highest version, then you'll start to, to kind of see that change. Some of these services, the default has already moved to Graviton. So if you go into Cost Explorer, maybe you'll start to see that you're already using these G instance types um, and you've actually started to save money. But a quick tip, if you go into the next slide, when you're changing things for managed services, I just wanted to highlight that all you need to do is go into your database. Uh, you can either do this in uh, infrastructure as code as you do, or if you're doing it, uh, in the console, you'll choose your G instances. So that's what it will look like in the console. And then apply during a maintenance window. So all this will do is in a maintenance window, it will do that change so you don't get any additional downtime for your change. And hey presto, you're using Graviton and you start to get some of that price performance saving. Okay, so that was a big overview of ways in which you can save. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, we can also share all the links. But Connor, I keep mentioning you. Do you want to take over and talk about how we can see this? <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Steph. Um, so today, Steph mentioned, from a C perspective, we're going to take a deeper look at how we can visualize some of our Graviton spend, really focusing on RDS and EC2 right in the console with Cost Explorer. But before we dive right into kind of a demo here, let's take a quick look at the pillar itself a little bit more closely, right? So as Steph was highlighting earlier, some of the core tenants of the C pillar are going to include things along the lines of cost reporting and monitoring, account and tagging strategies, as well as cost showbacks and chargebacks. Well, really two great AWS native tools and reports that we have to really get started here are gonna be one, AWS Cost Explorer, as well as two, uh, the AWS Cost and Usage Report. And this might be something that you've heard um, referred to as the CUR before. Really, with AWS Cost Explorer, it's gonna help you visualize, understand, and manage your AWS cost and usage over time. You can get started quickly by creating custom reports that are going to analyze cost and usage data at both a high level, and you can also start to dig in a little bit deeper. So, for example, if at a high level, all you really care about is going to be your total cost and usage across your entire um, AWS organization, that's a tool for you. Or if you're at the payer level and you want to dig a little bit deeper to identify specific trends, maybe pinpoint specific cost drivers or even anomalies, this is also a great starting point. Now, switching gears a little bit to the cost and usage report. This is really going to be your most comprehensive set of cost and usage data available. The CUR is going to track your AWS cost and usage, and it's going to provide estimated charges associated with your account. Really, the key here is that each report in the CUR is going to contain line items for each unique combination of products, usage types, and different operations that you might be running within your accounts. Really, you can customize the CUR to aggregate your information either by the hour, day, or month. So this is the most granular level of information we're going to get. So like I said, we're gonna get into a quick live demo of Cost Explorer, but before doing so, let's talk just a little bit more about the tool, what it is, and kind of things that we can leverage it for. So what is Cost Explorer? Really, Cost Explorer is just a free data visualization tool that you can use to view graphs of your AWS spend and usage data. It's easy to enable right within the AWS Billing Console, um, and it also actually leverages the same data set as the cost and usage report that we just talked about on the last page, right? So you're always, looking at one consistent set of data here. You can leverage Cost Explorer for a number of different things, not only just to visualize your costs, but you can also use it to find savings plans and reserved instance opportunities that Steph was talking about earlier, as well as to understand some reports on your utilization and coverage of those commitments. The beauty of Cost Explorer is it's not just a one point in time type of tool, but you can actually retroactively view your costs up to one year. Um, so today, obviously being February, 2023, if we want to do a look back at our costs all the way to February 2022, this would be a great starting point to do so. Some last things that we have here is just, you can always download the information you're going to get here um, into a CSV file for offline, offline analysis. You can generate reports that are easy to come back to so that you don't have to continually click and apply different filters. Um, and you can also use it as a bit of a forecasting tool to help you understand how much you're likely to spend over the next one, three, or 12 months. So now that we've talked about the tool itself, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull over um, the console here and we'll go through a quick live demo 
where we can visualize our EC2 graviton as well as our RDS graviton spend. And then we'll make a quick report just so that you can see the best ways to do this. So as you'll see here, just logged in, in the console, very easy to get to Cost Explorer. Obviously you'll see it's one of my recently visited tools, but if it isn't for you, all you have to do is start typing in Cost Explorer here in the search bar and it'll take you right there. Once Cost Explorer loads, you're gonna be greeted at the homepage, but really to start diving into some of your free visualization tools here, we'll go to this Cost Explorer tab on the left. And what you're gonna be greeted by is just a default view of your last six months of spend split out by service. Now, what you'll see is there's going to be a number of different parameters we have on the right that we can filter and group by. Um, I'll kind of take you through a couple, one of my favorite views for RDS and EC2 spend, um, particularly if we're looking to kind of identify Graviton. Connor, the can I stop I'm, you for a second? Can we yeah, zoom in absolutely. a little bit? I'm getting some questions in the chat. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Savannah. Perfect. So zooming in a bit, one of the first things that I'm going to do is I really only am curious about last month being January, as well as current spend um, in this month to date. So what I'll do is I'll just filter my date range time period, only to highlight January 2023 up to February 6th. You note that today being the seventh, the Cost Explorer data here is about on a day lag or so. The next thing I'm gonna do to get a little bit more granular information here, is I'm gonna switch my date range granularity from monthly to daily to see if there's any significant spikes in how much I'm spending. And if you look at that, you'll notice my, my daily spend has increased pretty significantly over the last week or two. Now what I'll do is I'll start actually on an EC2 um, visualization before moving to RDS. So what I'm gonna do here is I'll leave my dimension just by service and I'm gonna start applying filters down below. What I'll do is I'll click the filter drop down, and I'll actually just start typing in EC2. If I'm looking for my EC2 instances, I wanna specify instances, not ELBs or other. After applying this, you'll notice that because I'm grooving by service here and I'm applying a filter for a service, it doesn't really make much sense and I'm not getting a ton of helpful information out of this graph. So what I'll then start to do is I'll actually change my group by over to instance type, and this will help me start to visualize what type of instances am I running, right? Am I running any Graviton to date, um, or is it all just kind of standard type instances? What you'll see here is, looks like I'm starting to leverage some of these Graviton instances, really denoted by the G that Steph was mentioning earlier. You'll notice these all are a little bit more uh, modern in terms of when I started running them. The last thing I want to take a look at is to help me understand, okay, it's great how much I'm spending on my different instances, but how much of them am I actually using, right? How many Graviton instances am I running today per day? Here, a really helpful quick view is just going to be changing the usage type group filter and typing in EC2 apostrophe running. And what this is going to do is it's actually going to split the graph once I apply that running hours filter into two, the top showing your spend, the bottom showing your usage. I find this very helpful just to make sure that you, so that you can see, okay, it's great that one type of instance is a cost driver, but is that really what I'm running today? And this is helpful for you to get a little bit more information. Now, just to complete the, um, the quick demo, I'll, I'll remove these filters and we can do the same thing for RDS, just so that you can get a sense of what that would look like. So I'll clear all these filters. And what I'll do from a service perspective, I'll just change this to RDS. Make sure we click it and then hit apply. <laughs> so change that to RDS. On my usage type group, what I'm going to do is I'll just start typing RDS running hours instead of EC2. Notice just the slight change there. And here we're going to get a very similar graph, right? Looks like I'm running some R6G large RDS instances, um, some R6G XLs, as well as some R5 large and XLs as well. So this is a helpful way for us to just delineate, okay, how much Graviton am I using today? Am I using this in paired with other instances? So on and so forth. The last quick tip that we'll highlight here is because I'm applying a number of different, you know, cost and service filters, I can also apply some instance type filters if I only wanted to look at Graviton instances. So what I'll do is I'll do that. I'll just type in G period to only filter for Graviton instances. And now what I want to do is I want to actually save this report so I don't have to come in and continually manually replicating it. I'll scroll up here to the top here and you'll see here we have this option, save to report library. What I'll do here is I'll just type in RDS spend and usage as Graviton and I'll save this report. Now what I can do is I can just quickly come back over here to the reports tab and you'll see that this new report, RDS spending usage as Graviton will be easily accessible. So I don't have to continually come back and apply these different filters each time. Just helpful for the save a little bit of time. So 
I hope you, um, you got a couple helpful nuggets there out of the Cost Explorer demonstration. We're actually going to switch gears a bit and we'll start to talk about planning now. So in planning, what we'll focus on is the AWS pricing calculator, which is really just a web-based tool we'll get into a little bit more detail on. But the plan pillar itself, right, to just highlight back on what Steph was saying earlier, some of the things that we may think about as you're planning your AWS spending usage are going to be overall just budgeting and forecasting, right? Or maybe you're looking at POC-based cost estimations, or you're just helping your teams build a business case, um, as well as just articulate some of the value you could get from moving to cloud, right? So to help you accomplish some things like this, this there's three tools that I think are great starting points. One being the AWS pricing calculator, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail shortly. But the other two are really going to be AWS budgets, where we're going to get alerts and actions, as well as AWS budget reports. So what AWS budgets is, is it's a tool that's going to give you the ability to set custom budgets that are going to alert you when your costs or usage exceed or are forecasted to exceed um, a specified budgeted amount. You can use budgets to also set reservation and savings plan utilization or coverage targets. And that way you can receive alerts when your metrics drop below any thresholds that you set. And then the last thing here is just gonna be budget reports, right? And what budget reports are gonna do is they're just gonna help automate the status of your budgets and send them out to email recipients that you specify. So you're kind of always on track of where you are from a spend coverage or utilization perspective, and you don't have to constantly be coming into the console just to check things like that. So what we'll do now is we'll go through a quick demonstration of AWS pricing calculator where I will actually price out what it looks like, a cost difference perspective of um, Graviton instances on an EC2 basis. So flipping over here, what you can see is just kind of the greeting page of AWS pricing calculator. So what I wanna do is I just wanna create an estimate to understand what those cost differences are gonna look like. So I'll click this orange create estimate button. And the first thing you wanna make sure that you do is select the region that you're gonna be working in. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'll just leave it in Northern Virginia. For service, because we're interested in EC2 here, just start typing in EC2, and here we go. Start creating your estimate. I'm gonna add a description here, really just so that we can come back and compare the difference between Graviton and our standard instances, but this is totally optional. So I'll type in, this will be my Graviton um, estimate. EC2 specifications, right? This would be shared instances, dedicated host, dedicated instances, operating system, right? Linux, Windows, et cetera. Number of instances, I'm gonna just keep it at 10 just for the purposes of this demonstration. And what I wanna do is I'm actually gonna search inst instance type. I'll search M6G large. So I'll use M6G large instances for this demo. And if you scroll down, you'll see a number of different payment options, right? These are gonna be just your different commitment-based um, really discount mechanisms that we have. But here, I'll just keep it to on demand for the purposes of this demonstration. And then you'll see here within pricing calculator, there's a number of different optional fields you can add on, right? If you want to add on EBS spend, detailed monitoring, data transfer, so on and so forth. I'll leave these blank for the purposes of this demonstration, but they might be something that are super helpful for you to come in and play around with later, right? This tool is entirely free, so uh, feel free to use it and get familiar with it. Now what I'll do is actually save and add another service. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do another EC2 estimate. But here, this is just going to be my standard instances, right? So I'll look at standard. I'll make sure that the number of instances is 10, so it's apples to apples. And here I'll search m5.large, just so that we can see the price difference between M, m5 large and m6g large. I'll then change this to on demand, leave the rest of this blank, and here I'll hit save and view summary. Now really what you're gonna get is just a quick view to understand, okay, out of these two options, right, my Graviton and my standard view, what's the price delta look like? And if we do that math, exactly that 20% that Steph was mentioning earlier. We can use this tool for obviously a number of different services here at AWS. We just use EC2 and Highlighting Graviton here is the example, but please feel free to play around with this if you ever need help forecasting what your future AWS cost might be. So with that, now we'll switch it over. I'll hand it to Steph and she can go over some of the run um, run options here. Thank you, Connor. So I found that I always forget about the save option on the reports for Cost Explorer. I think it's like one of the most beneficial things that you can find out about it. Um, uh, so yeah, we're gonna, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to move on to run. So we mentioned earlier, it's a lot about the people as well as the technology and governance you set up at the start. So we're going to look over some examples of things to kind of get you started. So like I've got up on the screen, we have a couple of things. 
cost limits detection, infrastructure as code, and service control policies. So these are all things that you can set up to really help protect you against things like cost shock, and also make sure that you're building with efficiency in mind. So if we go through each one of these individually, so if we go on to um, anomaly detection. So this is a bit different to budgets that Connor mentioned. So budgets is all about setting that line and deciding, okay, I wanna know if all of my services or specific service is gonna hit this threshold of spend. So having that kind of forecast in mind or knowing that you have something decided up front how much you wanna spend. But anomaly detection is what those outliers, you're looking for things that you aren't expecting to kind of suddenly spark up and start causing costs. And this is where it will catch these weird things and then tell you. It's really good, especially when you have kind of services that might be smaller. For example, we've seen customers who use anomaly detection who have caught things like Lambda functions, who might be Lambda looping or kind of spiraling out of control because it might not be a massive spend in comparison to things like EC2, but you do wanna catch those issues because it helps improve what you're actually doing with your infrastructure and also catch any costs that are needed. So this is a really another thing that we can set, set up today. Really recommend it, budgets and anomaly detection for both different kind of reasons, but you can go away and set these up and hopefully, hopefully you'll never get an alert. That's kind of what you want. But if you do, you'll be thankful you got an alert rather than finding out one day when you get your bill. Um, so on to the next one, in, infrastructure as code. So I wanted to just mention infrastructure as code. I saw we had a lot of developers on there, so you probably are familiar with this. We're going to talk about cloud formation. So cloud formation is essentially a way of deploying infrastructure through files rather than going into the console and clicking through. Uh, it's basically the same thing as clicking through if you're thinking about it from what's the difference between cloud formation and going to the console. Well, cloud formation, you're basically kind of describing it, whereas in the console you're clicking through and deciding it live. The only difference is, the best difference is, is you can reuse that infrastructure as code. So whereas if you have to set up an EC2 and you manually do it every single day, that becomes a real burden. If you have infrastructure as code, you could just reuse that. So why is this important when it comes to cost and CFM? Well, Thinking about it from a, first of all, people point of view, it means you're faster to deploy, you get things up and running because you have that code already set. It already includes parameters, so you can set up variables such as if you want to use Graviton, you could set that as a default variable. If you need certain tags, you can set that up as a, de as a default variable. It also means you're less likely to have idle infrastructure, which I think is one of the biggest ones. So people making things manually can often lead to stuff being forgotten. Whereas if you have it all in your infrastructure as code, this is often reviewed, it's in a pipeline, and you can make changes there rather than something in a random region that suddenly starts causing you high costs that your anomaly detection will uh, start shouting about. So if you're not using it already, really recommend using infrastructure as code. And on the next slide, we have a bit of an example. So Lambda is one of the services that can use Graviton. And infrastructure of code wise, obviously Lambdas don't have um, the same instance types as RDS or uh, EC2 do. It's actually your architecture that you need to change. So I just wanted to highlight that as a small tip. And this is a nice way of, again, saving a bit of money, especially if you are a heavy serverless user, but you're going and change your architecture. Okay, on to the, the last one, which is service control policies. So these are types of organizational policies that you deploy to manage permissions across accounts. And these can be done at your organization level, your OU level, or your account level. And they're a way of setting up guardrails in your accounts. And there are lots of different use cases for them. I recommend going and reading about them before you maybe deploy them or create them and very much used with caution. And it's because what you said at that account level or OU level is the rules. If you say you are no longer allowed to use anything but Graviton, nobody can use anything but Graviton. It's a very strict policy. And the example in that picture is that. So if you are interested in forcing people to use Graviton, that's an example. I would be aware because if suddenly someone definitely needs to spin up an EC2 with Intel and they can't because you have this policy, this will kind of stifle innovation. So what we recommend to do is if you are going to use any service control policies, make sure that everyone is aware that they exist and also aware on the process to have an exception to the rule because sometimes that's the case. Sometimes you need to deploy in a region you aren't expecting or sometimes you need to use an instance type that isn't the norm. So as long if you are going to create these policies, make sure everyone knows them and there is a way to change them. Okay, so that kind of sums us up to the end of our talk on the CFM pillars. Hopefully you found 
that useful. We did cover a lot of different information. So see, save, run, plan. Uh, there is a blog series that has been just put out um, that we've worked on about these pillars that covers a lot of these topics with useful links in them that can be shared in the chat to get access to the first one, which is C. I really recommend checking them out mainly for the, the links to find out more information on a lot of the topics that we've spoken about today. But if you're generally looking to stay up to date, I just want to highlight these couple of things. So as I mentioned at the start, I have a Twitch show called The Keys to AWS Optimization that Savannah is a co-host on who's helping in the comments. And uh, Connor has been a guest on and is likely to be on <laughs> soon. Uh, and uh, this is a place where we uh, do 30 minute shows to help share information about pillars like this, service optimization, customers come on and talk. And it is a great kind of resource to get you started. We also have a lot of demos of services on there and all the past videos can be seen on our YouTube channel. Like I mentioned, a lot of really good cost blogs. There have been loads published recently with some great insights. So check out those and kind of have a little look through, see if anything piques your interest. And if you aren't aware, there is the CFM Peer Connect that was run by Lisa, who was talking at the start. A really great event I used to go when I was a peer, when I was a customer. It's a way for customers to share stories, learn from each other rather than just hearing from us. Uh, and it's a really good way to get involved. And we're always looking for speakers. So if you have a great success story you want to share, don't be afraid to, to kind of jump in and, uh, and email us there. And if you want to stay up to date, if you're on Twitter still, then we have a cost news bot that pops out anything to do with cost announcements. And I'm on AWS Steph also sharing a lot of announcements. So yeah, that is, that is it from us. Oh, thank you so much, Connor and Seth. That was awesome. Um, I know we also had the resource. You can have to leave the resources up for a second, I think. Okay. Um, yep. Yep. While we're well. starting to do some of those questions. So we had some of the, the things that I know they've been putting into the chat over there as well yeah. while we were talking. So back in the beginning, there was a demo for Cost Explorer. We had a question come in about how can you get things out of Cost Explorer to share with others? So maybe they don't have Cost Explorer access, or maybe you want to capture that point in time view. So what are your options for, for sharing that out? Definitely. Uh, Steph, I'll start, and then if you want to kind of go ahead. I think probably the easiest way to start would just be downloading the data as the CSV. So what you could do, for example, if you wanted to look at a specific snapshot in time, as in spend for January, apply any of the filters, look at any of the graphs that you'd want to see visually. And then what you could just do is you can actually download um, all that data and information as a CSV file that can be then shared externally um, with uh, you know your teammates or really anyone who's interested. I think that's probably your best bet, um, particularly just because it's going to give you the same view and the same exact data set that you're looking at within Cost Explorer. Yeah, I'd also mentioned that if you do want to go through a, a kind of CLI or Python script or any kind of scripting to get the data, you can do that. There is a cost for it, so mm -hmm. please check out if you're running a script every day to get that kind of data, you will incur cost explorer costs. It's like one of the few things you'll incur a cost in there. So I'd recommend using the cost and use report. If you want to be exporting out data, mm -hmm. you might as well use the cost and use report to do kind of regular reporting from that point of view using Athena. Mm. Yep. And then, so in order to get the graph, it's either be a screen grab or do some Excel or other programming work to get the graph back. Okay. Yep, um, you, you could do screen graph, or I, I think the way that the data would actually come in the CSV, you might have to transpose it, but it should be really straightforward to make a graph right out of it. And it should, I mean, form, color formatting wise will be a little bit different, but at least the data will be right there, at least in the easy way to make it in Excel. Okay, so we've talked, I mean, we, all of the examples that you went through here today were about like a single account. Is there any differences that people should be aware of if they're in an organization or they've got multiple accounts that they should take into consideration? Connor, do you want to do your pillars and I'll do mine? Yeah, definitely. I, I think from a C perspective, you'll want to understand what type of visibility you're giving your linked accounts, or if you're on a linked account level, what type of visibility you're getting from the payer account. Some examples that we will have in Cost Explorer of things you can hide would be specific types of discounts, savings plan sharing, things like that. So you want to make sure that you have a full kind of understanding of what's included and what isn't included in your data, because I've seen a lot of, honestly, kind of can just confusion in terms of why is my data look so much different from someone else who's on my team? And it could just be because they're looking at it through a different lens. So really just making sure that you understand that. Really ways that we'd seen that would be in kind of preferences and things like that within Cost Explorer, but we'll just wanna make sure that we fully understand, hey, is this inclusive of discounts, inclusive of any of my commitment-based discounts, things of that nature. Um, and then as it relates to plan, really it's gonna be the same things, right? When you're planning for, you know, 
moving your workloads online or whatever it's going to be, making sure that you fully understand any discount mechanisms you can leverage. I know in pricing calculator, we quickly glanced over looking at, you know, savings plans or RI type options, but then also making sure that you include things like EBS volumes if you're expecting that spend. This stuff is kind of highlighted, and I think a lot of the purpose of this is you don't want any cost shock. So making sure that you fully understand the data you're getting, fully understanding the data that you're including in, in any of your forecasts is going to be a really big uh, kind of starting point. At least and, for super uh, plans. Sorry, you go ahead, Seth. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll add on, uh, so especially around some of the services like budgets and anomalies section, you can create those at the organization layer to look across your entire account and kind of narrow them down, or you can create them at the linked account view. So if you're mm. if you're someone out there who manages an organization, set them up at the organization layer, and then you kind of can have a, a seat across it. But any alerts you get will be different from alerts people set at the linked account level, and you can't see a budget I think this was right, Connor, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. If someone sets a budget up at a linked account, you can't see it at an organization account. You'll have to create your own budget. And then um, for things like service control policy, I already mentioned that you can set those up for individual yeah. linked accounts as needed. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think those are the main ones for mine. And then if you're the end of the one to mention, we did talk about commits. Just a reminder, if you're going to buy savings plans or RIs, yeah. maybe consider buying them at a central location, such as your payer account, so that you can get the best optimization because they'll be sh sharing them across your organization because then they will kind of attack the thing that will save you those money first. So that's just something to be aware of. No, definitely. And I think definitely on that last point, I think there might actually be another CFM talk that they could, um, that audience members could take a look at where we go into some different strategies around that. So no, great call. Thanks, Steph. All right. Um, we've got a couple questions, so I'm going to ask it because it's come up a few times. Um, the different types of costs that you see in Cost Explorer. There's blended costs, net unblended costs. Mm. What? Why would you use the different ones? Like, how do? How? What would be the right way to think about those? Yeah, definitely. The two, the two that I can kind of probably speak the best to will be, um, I believe it's unblended and amortized. And the way that I always view unblended is that's almost kind of your cash cost. When is the cash coming in and going out? The way to think of that is it's going to align exactly kind of with your AWS invoice, right? If you pay for a an all upfront savings plan or reserve instance, it's going to hit in that month and you're going to see the data and the spend data hit in that month within Cost Explorer. Amortize naturally is going to just amortize those longer um, payments across the entire term. So a one or three year type commitment that you're purchasing is going to show up across those one to three years. Uh, instead of kind of in, in the first month there. Steph, I don't know if you want to touch on any of the other ones, but those are kind of the two that I see used most often. Um, naturally, for different reasons, I think I see actually unblended probably used most frequently just because that's going to be really aligned with your invoices. But just curious if you have a different perspective. Yeah, I used to use unblended the most because I feel like it's when you're caring about usage and seeing yeah. people are actually using, then mm -hmm. it, it kind of shows a little bit more detail. Uh, be aware that these columns are all the same in the cost and usage report. So there'll be different columns based on what setup you have. Um, and I've shared with uh, Savannah, I think she's going to share a really good cheat sheet. Um, uh, she can share it in the chat, a good cheat sheet list of like the different descriptions of them because it is quite confusing. But I think as long as you understand what one you need to see so for example if you have a moratize and you want to you want to see that distribution of like a savings plan because you care about the distribution of a savings plan then it will be different for your use case from blended so yeah i'd recommend uh kind of diving into that blog to, to get started and then to be to be fair savan or sorry steph i don't know if you've ever run into this but i've seen issues similar to what we were talking about earlier where um you know internally customers sometimes are saying hey why are my costs coming up so much differently than what someone else is reporting to me or vice versa so this is definitely something that a lot of times can cause pretty significant differences and just confusion on what could, could seem straightforward yeah and i would oh, also this just reminded me of uh, especially if you're doing things like internal chargeback mm -hmm. um so That's... a good use case for this we talk about cost explorer we're talking about seeing costs and usage report and blended versus blended i used to have this where we managed the centralized organization and we would charge back resources to our internal customers and we present them with a bill but they would have access to the cost explorer mm -hmm. and they would say like these these two things they don't match up yeah but that's because we were kind of distributing things like unused reserved instances charges. We were also adding in uh, premium support. We were kind of taking, maybe we were taking out tax and it was like all these things. So if you are doing any kind of internal charge back, 
I'd really recommend kind of setting parameters about how someone can see the same view or if it's going to be different, like what to expect in the difference so they can understand it. That's fine. Okay, so we talked before about savings plans a little bit and someone is looking for reports on savings plans that they've already purchased. So how do you monitor the saving plans you've already purchased versus looking at recommendations for new ones? Yeah, fine. Th that, that's a great question. Um, it's all going to be writing cost explorer. Uh, it's Connor, do you want to share? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, can you share it? I was going to say, I don't know if you have any savings plans, plans purchased. <laughs> let, let me let me pull it up here real fast, um, and I will pull it back over. And and we'll walk through the entire process. But really, I think the cost explorer um, visuals that you get for kind of savings plans utilization and coverage are excellent starting points. Right here. So bear with me while I pull this back up, and then. I will dive in. Okay. Steph, you might confirm me. You can see this, right? Yes, uh, yeah. Okay, awesome. So I'll dive right back into Cost Explorer. And given we're looking at kind of my internal dummy AWS account, the data might not be as helpful as what you would see on your side. But I think the best place to go for this type of information is first over here on the left, we're going to go under savings plans, kind of sub drop down, and this utilization report. What you're gonna see here is a graph, but really what it's highlighting is how much of my commitment am I actually utilizing, right? Ideally, this number is always gonna be at 100%. And what that's gonna tell us is I'm leveraging the entirety of the commitment that I made earlier, right? You'll see mine had been at you know, 93%, now it's at 97. So good, but not outstanding, right? This is also gonna give you information on how much did I spend on a savings plan? What would the spend have been had it been entirely on demand? And then naturally the delta there is gonna be your net savings. Once again, we can download this data here by download CSV, or we can download the table data here to actually get kind of line by line information about our savings plans. So this is a great starting point. Another, another visual that I'll highlight quickly is just gonna be the coverage report. This is gonna show you something a bit different, right? This coverage report is actually gonna say, not necessarily worried about the utilization of my savings plans, but out of the total compute that I'm leveraging in my account, what percentage of that on a dollar to dollar basis is being covered by a savings plan? So you'll see here, previously I was at 100%, okay, awesome. Looks like I spun up some resources in November and then even a few more there in January, right? So this is showing that my coverage is kind of decreasing on a you know, monthly or so basis. Once again, we can download this data. Um, we can change different parameters, just like what we went through uh, earlier in the demonstration um, and even add on some filters. So these are probably the two best starting points um, for you know, trying to get information about savings plans. And then the inventory tab, does that show you what you've already bought it's, in terms of it does yeah yeah great starting point so inventory tab here right under your overview is really just going to say okay what's my current fleet of savings plans look like how many are active how many are expired what type of savings plan are they right ec2 instance or compute what's my commit um, start and end dates all that kind of stuff and then we can really use this to kind of manage our savings plan fleet to make sure that as savings plans are expiring you know we're either renewing them, letting them expire because, hey, my utilization isn't 100% yet, things of that nature. Okay. Um, we had a call out back to the save pillar of, there have got applications that are heavily database and infrastructure is most of their AWS costs. What could they do for finding savings recommendations for those particular scenarios? Okay, so if we're going, I'll go for the RDS first. So a couple of things, we mentioned Graviton. If you are using an open source uh, engine, then you can take advantage of Graviton. Would really recommend checking that out as that is like a, a quick win saving like we talked about. Uh, I'd also look at right sizing. So again, a lot of people will spin up infrastructure and never check their CloudWatch metrics to see how much they're actually using and maybe move on to kind of a smaller size instance type if you're not using the full capacity of CPU, memory, read writes, etc. Uh, have a look at that data and then once you have resized then look at reserved instances. So I really like we said if you because if you buy a reserved instance for your compute, you can't make any changes. So you can't be changing, it's not like a savings plan, you have to keep the same uh, instance size, I think, and uh, it's been a while since I've done reserved instances. No. Um, that's right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would check that 
as well and, and kind of go for coverage, but also check about uh, could you turn off your instances when you're not using them. So instance scheduler works for EC2 and for RDS. And so if you are not using your RDSs in the weekend uh, or in evenings, then you can turn those off. Again, check your coverage of reserved instances first, because if you're turning them off and mm. you're then get, getting wasted RIs, then, then maybe that's not the best idea, but definitely do that as well. I'd also check out if you need to have kind of static infrastructure, could you use things like auto scaling groups with some RDS uh, uh, instances that are available and kind of maybe move to that uh, or even Dynamo if you if you don't need, if you can have NoSQL. So there are a few ways of doing it. The easy ones, Stephanie, Graviton, scheduling, resizing and uh, RD, RIs. But then also I would check and see if you could use any kind of auto scaling. Connor, unless you could think of anything else. No, definitely. That was, was, I think, you're spot on. I'm kind of curious, Steph, from your perspective, do you see a lot of those right sizing recommendations that are really kind of immediately impactable? You think Trust Advisor is a good place to start, or where would you, or do you just go right into CloudWatch? Like, what's your perspective there? So I was just going to say, uh, you reminded me, Trusted Advisor uh, is more about the idle RDS, so it won't show you resizing, but that's a good point. It will show you if there's no connections. Um, and so if there's no connections, maybe you could delete that instance. So that's something to check check out Trusted Advisor if you have access to it. But yeah, I would say CloudWatch, if you just go onto the individual uh, RDS instances, you can go on the monitor tab and see the CloudWatch metrics and then maybe even dive into it a bit deeper. Or there's a, a lab, if you want to track it over time, there's a lab called the Optimization Data Collector in the 300 level well-architected labs. And you can check that out and it has uh, a module which allows you to capture that or that uh, CloudWatch data from all the RDSs in your organization. This is really useful if you're listening to me and saying, oh, but I have 20 accounts. So I don't want to have to go into each one of the different instances to go and mm. see that data. You could just pull that into one location. So maybe check out which, using Cost Explorer, which accounts have the biggest uh, spend on RDS first, and then see if you can kind of drill down and figure out which um, resources you could make alterations to to optimize. Mm -hmm. And then I will just put in one other plug. Um, this is a time when searching our blogs can be really helpful, depending on what you're seeing is a big expense um, that you weren't expecting you're looking to optimize. There are always blogs about how do I optimize different things. I think there was a recent one about how do I optimize CloudWatch. So go and see what's out there. Those specialists are also writing other blogs that we aren't always aware of. There's a lot of us out here all. Um, so there's other places that you might see something within the blog space at AWS on, on those optimizations. Yeah, check out your CloudWatch then. <laughs> everyone out, everyone go, yeah, find that blog. Everyone's <laughs> always spending too much money on CloudWatch, so support that. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the ones I, I've heard a couple times lately, so. Hmm. The other, so another one we have is about being able to see level different levels of detail. So if I wanna see a level of detail that's not in Cost Explorer, what are my options? I'm thinking yeah, here, there are different levels of detail just in Cost Explorer. Yeah, no. <laughs> Before that, you even go to the cost usage yeah. report, so let's start there. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Uh, so a, a lot of times, Lisa, exactly. Starting right in here in Cost Explorer, I'll actually pull this back up again because I'll just kind of highlight some examples of the different group eyes people we can leverage to get a better sense of okay, like EC2 other is one example. What does that actually mean? So I'll pull this back up and we can just quickly run through it. But I think that this is. A really helpful starting point is just play around with the different group eyes and get a better understanding of what type of information they're actually you know providing um the example that i'll talk about here will just be if we're looking at ec2 other type spend i think i have some here right okay this is just a bucket obviously the spend numbers aren't huge in this account but what does ec2 other actually mean a lot of times let's just filter around on these group eyes we'll start at api operation actually let's start at usage type, usage type just because it's right there okay this is going to immediately start to give me a little bit more information right Looks like I'm spending most of my EC2 other on GP2, um, and then some of it on you know US West, US West 2 GP2 and volumes, right? So this is a great starting point. Um, I also leverage API operation a lot, right? Just gives you very similar type of information, but buckets it a little bit differently. So I think a great starting point is really just almost playing around with this group by. Steph, I don't know if you do anything else, at least within Cost Explorer. I think obviously cost and usage reports, quick site dashboards, we can talk into as well. But anything, any other quick tips that you'd Share for this. 
No, API and usage type are definitely the ones to go into, yeah. especially for things like CloudWatch is a good example, and um, EC2 other is a constant question of what does this actually mean. But yeah, yeah. do you want to go into the customer use report and then I'll, I'll jump in after? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's kind of funny because I know Steph, as part of the prep calls for this week, I almost had like an argument of where do you start? Do you start in the customer use report? Do you start in customer use report? This, that, the other. <laughs> so a lot of times, Generally, just when I'm kind of digging around, starting cost explore, understand exactly what I'm trying to filter down on, and then we'll leverage the, that cost and usage report that we mentioned earlier, which is really going to be our most granular level of information that we're going to get on like, spend and usage data. Within the cost and usage report, you can get literal start hours in terms of when was this resource started. You can get an English language description just from, hey, this was an on-demand Linux M5G instance, things like that. So I think anytime you need a ton of information, almost more than you can comprehend, let's use the cost and usage report, pull more information than you need, and then you can always kind of filter it that way. But Steph, that's kind of just the way that I do it. I'm curious if you have a different um, method. The big thing I would say is the resource ID that you can't see in Cost mm. Explorer is what you can see in the curve. Yeah. So if you want to see what volumes are costing you money or what S3 buckets, then you need to, you can go into that. And just to mention the cost and usage report and Cost Explorer is the same data. It's just yeah. Cost Explorer has a nice visual that you can go into and is an interactive <laughs> drop down. Whereas the Cost News Sport is all that SQL and, and muddy queries yeah. you have to write. So um, it does give you more data. There's a lot of columns. There's a lot of stories about people printing out the this data set. I'd recommend maybe just using Athena and just kind of getting an idea of it rather than trying to download a CSV. And on mm -hmm. that, um, I urge you to go to the well architected labs and look at how to create a curve to give you that detail because you have to enable resource IDs you have to tick a box for that to use Athena you have to use parquet format to get that per hour information you have to choose per hour um so yeah look into the world architecture labs 300 level uh, sorry 100 level cost you'll see some cost and use information it's I find it so so useful that's like I said I, I will use cost explorer to get the high level and as soon mm -hmm. as I want to go granular I use that cost and use report and it does seem a bit intimidating if there's a lot of data and you're not used to it but in the well architect labs we have a bunch of queries that can get you started and just to mention on the person who asked about the difference between linked account and organization organizations when you create a cost and use report that will look across all of your organizations all of your different accounts whereas if you create a cost and use report in your linked account it'll only look for that linked account the only reason that you might have multiple accounts is if you have um, aws billing conductor set up which will have a pro forma bill created for groups of accounts but that's a whole different conversation so uh, just check which account you're deploying into and what data you'll have access to Definitely. And one last thing I want to add stuff, just because I called that out as kind of a, um, a limitation of Cost Explorer, right? Your cost and usage report can look back through the time that you had have it set up, right? Cost Explorer, we said you can only look back 12 months. So if you need older data or you're looking, you know, trends across the last five years, that's another point where, hey, we're probably gonna have to start in the curve there too. Yep. All right. So we've had a couple questions about Kudos um, and those cloud intelligence dashboards. We just talked about the curve. So that is the next step on top of that. We've got some well architected labs around that. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna, we don't have time. We've only got three minutes. But there are some questions about some things like ELBs or uh, load balancer usage. Some weird, some things we don't talk about all the time. How would you have someone look at those? Like, what, is there any tips for those ones? Yeah, for ELBs, I would use Trust Advisor as a good way to see if you have um, like no instances attached to your load balances or low utilization for attachment, uh, because you've often deployed them because you need them there to connect to your EC2. And there are no kind of, there's not many weird configurations you can do with an ELB to save money. It just depends, are you actually using them and are the instances healthy at the back end? Because often in things like development accounts, if you are, are just kind of working on code and those ELBs are just hitting nothing, you are just spending money on them. So maybe taking a step back from that, you could think about how often you spin your infrastructure up. So if you are building in dev and you're building kind of applications on your EC2s, I'm thinking back to when I was trying to do this when I was a developer, but I would be building code and testing out user scripts. And often when I'd be setting things up, my instances in my earbuds weren't really doing anything. They're just sitting there and they are spending money when you're using them. So maybe think about, could you add processes in your organization to delete your entire infrastructure overnight? Like, do you actually need all of it running? Probably not if you're development. And especially if you have infrastructure as code, you could just spin that thing up first thing on a Monday morning. 
so maybe one thing to think about is first of all check your kind of traffic going through it use trusted advisor to see if it's actually connected to anything and then try and consider spinning stuff down on weekends or in the evening especially in dev or sandbox accounts fun or anything else yeah. Nope, nothing else. Uh, I was thinking about it more in like in terms of visually understanding uh, information. A lot of times what I would do is this is where I'd leverage the occur, kind of pull EC2 related spend, pull that description, resource idea, like pricing units, things like that, where we can then really start kind of chilling down on other things like that. But I think you covered it much better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much. We are in our final minute. So I just want to say thank you so much for being here today, sharing all the knowledge you have. I hope the audience has gotten a lot. I know they've got a lot out of it. Um, and we are so excited to have you. Thank you so much for helping people with how to get started in their CFM journey, especially take, walking through a concrete example as we did it, and then all of the questions you guys have answered over the last 20 minutes. So thank you, Connor, thank you, Steph, and thank you everybody in the audience, and everybody have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Okay.